Good evening, I'm Katherine Pratt, and this is Sunday Edition. In the next half hour, we'll bring you a recap of the top local news stories of the past week, as well as our Sunday Edition cover story and people segment. <laughs> In our cover story, United Farm Workers, The Long March. We've always heard the growers tell us that they didn't have any money, they were broke. But we look over, they were buying more tractors and buying more acres and getting better homes and driving Cadillacs. And they always kept telling us, we we're broke, we don't have any money. Now, they cry wolf once too often. You know, that a grower puts his entire livelihood, his monetary livelihood, and his family well-being on the line and takes all the risks, and yet, if you don't allow the farm worker under his philosophy to run the ranch, then you are not treating that farm worker with dignity. In our people section, actor, director Luis Valdez. Uh, the possibility of going back to Delano, where I was born, arose uh, with the farm labor strike. And uh, I put the whole thing together and dreamed up El Teatro Campesino and went to Delano and it became a reality. Coming up on Sunday edition. <laughs> The agricultural industry affects our daily lives, whether we're farm owners or farm workers or consumers of the fruits of their labors. Even the wages and working condition of farm laborers have become everyone's business due to the efforts of the United Farm Workers and its leader, Cesar Chavez. To some, Chavez is the working man's hero. To others, he's responsible for high food prices. But upon one thing, they all agree. In his years as the union leader, Cesar Chavez has had a profound impact impact upon the agricultural industry in this state. For nearly 20 years, Cesar Chavez marched in protests and spent time behind bars to bring attention to the working conditions of farm laborers. His 24-year-old son, Paul, shown here with his father, was practically raised on the picket line. But the problems facing the UFW today are far different from those at its founding convention in 1962. The union spent its first dozen years trying to gain recognition from farmers who had been resisting unionization since the 1930s. Verga, verga, verga. Come out of the field! Come out of the field! The workers needs to go. The biggest uh, condition was that they were frightened. Uh, they didn't know what unions were. They had never had a union. They didn't know how unions work. All they knew was that there may be their cousin or their father or an aunt or an uncle belonged to a union someplace, somewhere, and that was a good thing. But in terms of their lives, they had never been involved in unions. So that was, fear was one great obstacle we had. Do any of the people in here know what a union is? What it's for? So maybe their kids can go to school like yours will? So maybe they can live in a house instead of a labor camp? Maybe someday when they work, they can have bathrooms? Generally, they had no say-so in terms of their working conditions or their, or their wages or their hours. We generally found uh, workers working uh, under labor contractors or working directly with employers without just minimal protections. Uh, for instance, uh, the question of drinking water was a big issue. Uh, toilets in the fields were big, big issues for the workers. Uh, $1.25 an hour, that's what they wanted in those days. It was a big issue for them. attention to the problems of farm workers and create solidarity among them, Chavez organized a 380-mile protest march in September 1965 from the grape fields of Delano to the Capitol building in Sacramento. Along the way, hundreds more joined in the march, among them Sunday Edition director Steve Rosen, who filmed the pilgrimage for the documentary Huelga. While the UFW struggled to become a union, it was also a social movement. It was, in fact, the first union dominated by Mexican-Americans, organizing some of the nation's poorest workers. Our membership and the people we deal with are basically immigrants. And so basically they have problems that other American workers don't have now, but they used to have when they built their own unions 50, 100 years ago. And these problems are the problems that deal with citizenship and language and racial prejudice, so that when we deal with those problems, then, then we, we have to add to our program those programs that deal with these 
questions. For instance, our uh, Martin Luther King Farm Worker Fund uh, programs where we deal with social services away from the employer-employee relationship. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, getting a social security card, uh, immigration, problems that the American worker doesn't have, you know. But we have those problems, so we have to then uh, tend to those needs. So then it makes us, makes us like a movement because we're doing more than just the traditional collective bargaining uh, work that other unions do. But, but other unions did the same thing we're doing in those days when it was necessary for them to do. The march resulted in nationwide recognition of a fledgling union dedicated to bettering the plight of farm workers. But the show of solidarity was more than symbolic. In the years to come, legislation would pass recognizing the United Farm Workers as the collective bargaining agent for more than 30,000 dues-paying members. Somewhere, somehow, these people are never going to be the same. Uh, it's very important to us that people question, that they participate, and that they're never afraid to have some principle and stand, up by, and stand by that principle. And I think that this, we've, we've accomplished this. Today, the lives of most farm workers are far better than in 1965. Union wages average $6.25 an hour. Still, some migratory farm laborers live in substandard housing. Labor camps like this one tend to be occupied by undocumented workers and their families. These non-union campesinos earn the same wages, but they lack the job security union benefits like seniority can provide. Because of the wages and the working conditions, living conditions, there's also the whole impact that it had on kids. Uh, we found out in, right in the beginning of our first contracts that once the workers began to get seniority, they were able to say, this is my job because I have a, a contract here and there's a seniority here. They had impacts far beyond just the field and the relations with the employer. We began to see the lending institutions and the schools and, and uh, the judges and the police and everybody else uh, fix on the, on, on the idea of seniority as something, as some kind of stability. For instance, uh, credit opened up to workers because if they had seniority, there was, a, there was something very good for their credit. Uh, in school, if they had seniority, then they know they, the school authorities know that the kids would be around because the father had seniority. They, the impact of seniority, I can tell you that it's had a tremendous um, uh, consequence in the lives of workers in and outside their job. Even the growers are beginning to see the benefits of the UFW seniority system. But Salinas labor lawyer Andrew Church says Chavez's seniority plan is one most of the industry can't figure out. Still, the attorney grudgingly admits there may be advantages to seniority for farm laborers. Seniority is the backbone of any union. That is not any different now. I don't know that you could say that benefits a grower as such. Uh, loyal employees were coming back years anyway. Uh, it does help with the quick type harvest where you need workers for a short period of time. If they have seniority, they know they can go back to that ranch and can be employed rather than having to wonder if they're going to be employed. And I think it, the, since the system in that respect has helped both the grower and the employee. As a labor attorney and now legal counsel for the Grower Shipper Vegetable Association in Salinas, Church has sat across the bargaining table from Cesar Chavez since 1968. I believe that their philosophy is just as Cesar Chavez said at his convention uh, just two weeks ago, that uh, there is no good grower, he hates them all, he would not have a cup of coffee with any of them. That I think permeates throughout his entire organization. And it's very difficult to deal with someone that you can't build a trust relationship, you can't even build a normal communicative relationship. You just have to put up with the fact that uh, there is no appreciation that a, that a grower puts his entire livelihood, his monetary livelihood, and his family well-being on the line and takes all the risks. And yet, um, if you don't allow the farm worker under his philosophy to run the ranch, so to speak, uh, then you are not treating that farm worker with dignity. They're, all the growers are not the same, of course, and all the industry within, the, within agribusiness are not the same. We have a lot to learn about them, but uh, as the longer we live, the more we're able to find out how they tick and how they operate. 
and uh, it's a great mystery to us. See, one of the disadvantages is that all these years that I worked in, in, in farm labor uh, before the union, a good 20 years before, and then since I've been involved for, what, 40 years or so, we've always heard the growers tell us that they didn't have any money, they were broke. Now, they cry wolf once too often, you know, so you can't really believe them now, because how can you believe them when they've been telling you all their life? I mean, I remember as a kid, you know, we go, we, pick, we were picking cotton for uh, $2.50 a hundred weight. And then, uh, terrible, then, we, then, the, the, then the, uh, the war ended, back in the Second World War, and they, they came back and were going to pass a dollar and a quarter because they didn't have any money. But we look over, they were buying more tractors and buying more acres and getting better homes and driving Cadillacs. And they always kept telling us, we, we're broke, we don't have any money. So when you cry wolf too often, you know, now it may be true in some cases, but how can you believe them? The lettuce workers contract runs out in August 1982. Growers and union leaders are already beginning to ponder the possible effects of another strike, like the one that put the lettuce industry on ice back in 78-79. How will the strike in the lettuce fields affect the growing, the agricultural industry in this area and the people that live here? As someone said, uh, the, the ground will always be farmed, but it may not be in lettuce or the labor-intensive crops as we now know it. Because we... Uh, Economics and a profit is the name of the game. If you can't make a profit, uh, then you'll grow something that can make a profit, or you'll quit business. Do you think that striking is losing favor with the public in general? It's hard to say, Sid, because more people are striking. For instance, uh, air traffic controllers, who ever heard of them, you know? They were pretty professional people, now they're striking. And 10 years ago, uh, teachers and uh, baseball players Whoever thought they'd strike. So you take along those lines, uh, strikes may not be as popular, but there are more people involved in strikes to be able to get their rights as workers. See what I mean? We look at strikes as the, the ultimate, the very last thing we'll do when everything else has failed. But if it has to be done, done it will be. Yeah, we're, not, we're not a union. We've never been afraid of strike. Uh, and we're not, you know, but we're not looking for a strike either. If we can settle without a strike, beautiful. We can't. We're not going to sit there and beg when we have the, the, the right to strike, and of course we'll use it when we have to. I much rather see that, that uh, things be settled without a strike. Much rather, any time. Strikes are difficult. They're, uh, they put tremendous pressure on workers. Okay, what's the point? What do you expect the reaction of people to be who hear about this? Well, anyone who, anyone who's conscious of the, uh, of the, of the uh, First Amendment rights ought to be concerned. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty peaceful uh, operation, but the burden is nevertheless on us trying to defend uh, those rights every time we go into a strike, and it's getting, I'm getting tired of it. Thank you. Yes, the pilgrimage was not the end, uh, so will the strike not be an end. Uh, some will choose to settle for a wage increase and settle for a better working conditions. Others will never be content with that. They will then will be the responsible ones to have other delenos, other pilgrimages, so that the uh, spirit continues. And so the story continues. As for the lettuce worker contract, it appears that growers and farm workers are facing a long, hot summer of negotiations. After 16 migrant years of touring the U.S., Europe, and Mexico, El Teatro Campesino has come home to San Juan Batista. The Farm Workers Theater, as the name translates, was created by Luis Valdez on the UFW picket lines. Today, the theater and its creator have come of age. Valdez, the writer and director of a successful Broadway play, Zoot Suit, has spent the last year turning his work into a major motion picture. Meanwhile, El Teatro Campesino has begun its first season in its permanent home. It's difficult to pinpoint exactly where it all began. In some ways, it, it began when, uh, I mean, the teatro began when I was six years old and uh, I fell in love with theater. Um, my family was, was on the migrant path at the time. It was one of the things that I did do as a kid very early on was 
perform in whatever labor camp we happen to be in. I did puppet shows. Um, I eventually had a ventriloquist act. And uh, started to think about writing for the theater, writing plays. And uh, one thing led to the other, and eventually in college, that's what I ended up doing. I, I ended up being an English major with an emphasis on creative writing. I decided to become a playwright. I started writing plays that were produced in college, a couple won awards and so forth. And then suddenly uh, the possibility of going back to Delano, where I was born, arose uh, with the farm labor strike. It met my political ideals at the time, and uh, I put the whole thing together and, and uh, dreamed up El Teatro Campesino and went to Delano, and it became a reality. And so, since that time, 16 years later, we have uh, continually evolved into uh, what we are today, uh, a professional theater company. These days, I try to treat human beings pretty much as human beings. Uh, I try not to cancel anybody out. Uh, no matter what they look like or, or, or what I might assume about them, you know, if I lend myself to easy assumptions, uh, I try to reach into their, their hearts and minds and communicate. And that's really what the nature of the, the work here is all about. It is human communication. We're trying to quite seriously break down the, the, the barriers, uh, those things that create misunderstandings. And uh, naturally, we all have political differences. You line up every individual against another individual, and you're going to encounter differences. However, uh, the differences can make life interesting. This is really what we're talking about. And America has been a place that's been able to encompass so many different viewpoints. That's what we're celebrating with our company. And that's what we're trying to celebrate with our presence here in San Juan. It was a secret fantasy of every vato, living in or out of the pachucada, to put on the zoot suit and play the myth. Zoot Suit is uh, a play that uh, bases itself in a piece of history from the 1940s. The Zoot Suit was classy, it was, it was still a suit, and yet it had these flowing lines. Uh, it was an unusual look, and uh, it caught on with Chicanos the way it caught on with everybody else. The people that wore these, the Zoot Suiters, uh, had a Chicano name called Pachucos. In, in Los Angeles, it became associated with the gangs, and the gangs that were just starting to form, because L.A. hadn't really had Chicano gangs as such. And so this led eventually to a sensational case in 1942 called the Sleepy Lagoon murder case, in which a whole Chicano gang was put up on trial for the murder of this one Chicano. In the meantime, while they were in prison, the tensions in, in Los Angeles had continued to um, rise, and in 1943, there were the Zoot Suit riots, in which servicemen roamed the streets of Los Angeles looking for Zoot Suiters and stripping them of their clothes and beating them up. And it became sort of a hidden chapter in American wartime history. My play sort of re-invoked all of that, and I put those two incidents together, the Sleepy Lagoon case and the Zoot Suit riots. The hopes for the film are that it will show people across the country what the play was. I don't know what the critical response to it will be, but ultimately with movies, it's a question of the audience. The point is, is to take the rancher and to put him on the stage. Put him up on the stage so that other people can see what he's like. We were uh, a theater company. We are a theater company that was born on the picket lines of the United Farm Workers. We're in favor of the resolution and certainly the celebration of coming together as an audience and enjoying a play and being able to laugh and being able to listen to the music and, and stamp your feet to the dancing. This is ultimately our goal. That's our Sunday edition for tonight. Join us next week for Driving Under the Influence. Until then, I'm Katherine Pratt. Good night.
fall, reach for the stars. Reach for MASH now every weeknight and...